This is the Hermetic Hour, and I'm your host, Polk Runyon. Tonight, we'll present a uh, lecture on the magic of Franz Barden, the 20th century European alchemist and magician. Now, Barden was the author of three books on magic and one semi-autobiographical novel. His Eastern-style methods of training owed much to Raja and Tantra Yoga, and they've had a considerable influence on modern Western practice. Now, we'll discuss each of his three books in sequence, where his information came from, what his philosophy was, and you'll learn about fluid condensers, volts, elementals, magnetic and electric fluids, and magic mirrors. Now, we'll discuss his get to P.B. Randolph, and we will discuss the origins of his myriads of spirits and the way he derived his sigils. We'll deal with his unique concept of Kabbalah. And then Barden's background as a professional hypnotist and alchemist, a healer, and we'll compare that to his mundane life and some of his problems. Uh, the master, of course, was an overweight chain smoker who died after eating a bacon sandwich, but he was still the master, and we should appreciate him all the more for the faults that made him human. Now, I mentioned that we would... <laughs> that you would find out why Simon King of the Witches kept saying magnetic electric, magnetic electric, while he was having fun with the DA's daughter. That's a reference to the 1971 cult film Simon King of the Witches, which according to urban legend, I was the model for Simon, but I, I really, I, I, I think I want to back out of that one. <laughs> but there, there, is a, there is more Bardonian magic uh, or at least their version of Bardonian magic shown in Simon King of the Witches than perhaps any other film that's ever been made. Uh, so you might want to keep that in mind. Well, um, Franz Barden was born in, uh, in 1909, and he died in 1958. He was barely 50 years old. Uh, he had a hard life. He spent three and a half years in a Nazi concentration camp. Uh, of course, he wasn't, he, he wasn't Jewish, and he wasn't a gypsy, but they also came down on, on uh, occultists and, and on homosexuals, too. Barden certainly wasn't homosexual, and he wasn't Jewish, and he wasn't a gypsy, but he really was an occultist. So he ended up spending three and a half years in a Nazi concentration camp during the war, and, and they, they didn't treat him very well. Uh, now, Barden was born in 1909, and... He was a Czechoslovakian, and his father, uh, his father was, uh, Victor Barton was a student of Rosicrucianism and, and Hermetic science in the Rosicrucian tradition. And when young Franz graduated from public school, in other words, when he was just about ready to go into what we would call high school, uh, he um, took an apprenticeship at the Minerva sewing machine factory, and he was going to be a sewing machine mechanic. And at the, about that time, something very, very strange happened to him. He, he, uh, his personality completely changed. Uh, this is what is called in occult terminology a walk-in. In other words, Oh, little Franz, the the uh, the apprentice sewing machine mechanic, suddenly he left, and Franz Barden, the magician, came in. This was almost as if an alien uh, presence had had walked into this uh, to this young man's uh, soul and body. So at this point, Victor Barden, Franz, uh, Franz's father had to realize that his young teenage, well, his, by this time, Barton was getting, you know, into his, into his middle teens, that, that his son was his, his guru. His son was, was suddenly uh, a, a fully, almost fully developed spiritual being. Now, uh, this, uh, this is a remarkable case, but uh, there have been other cases like this, and, and, and this, is, um, this is what happened with, with Franz Barden. Um, he went along, um, of course, he left the sewing machine uh, factory, and 
he became a, a, a professional alchemist and a healer. He, he, he used his, uh, his alchemical methods and homeopathic medicine. In fact, he actually became a, a doctor of homeopathic medicine at one point. He uh, was just as much of an alchemist, if not more, uh, than a magician. Now, this is a part of Franz Barden's life that we don't know very much about because he never got a chance to publish his book on alchemy. That was going to be, that was going to be his fourth book. Um, and he never got around to publishing it because he, he died before that happened. But, uh, and unfortunately, the communist Czech police shredded all his notes, and so we'll never get Barden's alchemy book. But um, Barden went on uh, before World War II, and he became a stage hypnotist, a mentalist. Uh, he was one of these mind readers that could go out on stage and you put an object on a, somebody from the audience would put an object down on the table like a watch or a, a necklace, and he would pick it up, and he would give you the entire history of it, plus uh, enough of your history that... <laughs> <laughs> that was somewhat embarrassing, and and uh, he was a very 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 good mentalist, um, and also uh, he was as as we know uh, in the Hermetic tradition he was a he was a marvelous ceremonial magician. Now Barden wrote uh, and published three books. Uh, the first book is called Initiation into Hermetics. And what this is, is a complete course in spiritual development all the way through from, from neophyte to adept. This is a complete personal course of spiritual development. There's nothing like this has ever been published before. And I want to talk about this book a little bit because, um, and then we'll move on to his next book in, in sequence. Initiation into Hermetics is a remarkable, remarkable book. And uh, Barden, Barden claimed uh, that he had been in his previous incarnation, he had been a Tibetan Lama. Well, you know, I think he probably uh, he probably was on the nose on that uh, on that. I think he really he really was, because what he did that nobody else had, had done it up to that time. Nobody else had even attempted to combine Tibetan techniques with Western philosophy and make a perfect blend of Western philosophy and Tibetan yoga techniques. And, and put the two of them together, and then come up with a training program where a normal, and I say normal, I mean a normal intelligent human being, not a psychic, not a clairvoyant, and just a normal intelligent human being who really wanted to be a hermetic magician could take this book, this Initiation into Hermetics, and faithfully do these exercises and come out the other end uh, in a couple of years, maybe three years, would, could come out a, and actually be a hermetic adept. Nobody, nobody had even begun to do a thing like this. Julius Avila had, yeah, he was interested in yoga and he did a bit, and also in Western magic, but he didn't put the two together. The same thing with Crowley. Crowley was interested in yoga and he taught yoga and he and he recommended yoga and all of this, but he never put magic and yoga together. He thought he did, but he didn't really. He, he, he had to, doing one separately and then doing the other separately, and he never actually blended them the way Barden did. Uh, and Barden, Barden's training program is absolutely outstanding, and and the depth of Barden's knowledge. Now, um, well, we'll assume just you know to be cynical, we'll assume that. Victor, his father, the Rosicrucian student, that he probably had a pretty good library. And obviously, young Barden, as soon as he had this epiphany that he had, he probably devoured his father's library. All right, well, that's, that's fine. But, but Barden's knowledge goes way, way beyond that. And Barden, his, his grasp of Eastern, of Eastern methods, Barden knew more... He knew more about Raja Yoga, and I've got, I think, I've got six or seven books on Raja Yoga. Now, it's supposed to be the best ones available, but 
until I, frankly, I learned more from, from my friend Oberon Silesio about, about Raja Yoga than I have from all six books on it. Because Raja Yoga, it was, it, it, you have to learn it from an Eastern master. But Arden knew it. He knew how to, how to take the hermetic elements. And now this is Western now. This isn't the, this isn't the Chinese elements. It's not the, 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 the way the Hindus do it. This is Western. This is Empedocles. This is Pythagoras. This is, this is the Western tradition now. And Barden knew how to take it. these four elements and spirit, which he tied to the Kabbalistic Tetragrammaton, and he said, this is it. This is where we start. We start with these elements. We balance them in our own personality. We create our own magic mirrors where we look at the, the balance of the elements in our personality, and we rebalance them. In other words, this is, this is a form of, of, of elective astrology here in a sense. You're going to take your horoscope and you're going to, and you're going to say, okay, I'm too heavy in this and I'm too light in this and I'm, going to, and, and, and I'm going to balance myself out. And that's a whole process in itself, which, which the magician does. And then you learn <coughs> to completely control the mind. You learn... Uh, uh, literally to to not empty the mind but completely calm the mind and you learn to observe your thoughts and you learn uh, and all this in, in a perfect sequential program now it's not easy Barden's program is not easy and we've discovered over the years we've discovered some shortcuts that make it easier to do and I'll talk about those later but but uh, it, the program that he lays out is a balanced Raja. It's actually it, it it leads more toward Raja Yoga, real Raja Yoga, than it does to toward Tantric Yoga, because we're talking about these four elements, these these super elements, not uh, not fire as we and air and earth and water as as you know them, as you put your hands on them or in them or whatever. These are the, the philosophical elements with spirit. And you you can you can become complete a complete master of these elements, and then you learn how to visualize, how to concentrate, and how to visualize, and and how to become clairaudient, and all these exercises are a regular sequential training program all the way up through astral projection, and mental projection, and and. Um, uh, just uh, a, a a a book like nobody has ever ever written or attempted before. Now, I you know I I I I, I want to kind of um, put out something for you to think about here. We think about uh, the uh, the great magicians in in Western history like John Dee and and Count Cagliostro and. And uh, and and even uh, even Agrippa, they, they, these magicians who did not these these magicians had to had to go out and hire psychics to have the visions for them, or they used children to have the visions for them. They didn't have a program like this. Sure, people in the Far East. They did, but, but nobody in the West, up until Barden, nobody in the West had the, the course, the training, the way to train a person to actually be his own scryer. And this is, fun, this, this is fundamentally important, and it's, it's, it's uh, uh, really, uh, 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 I, can't, I can't stress the importance of this too much, because in this way, if, if D now, quite frankly, if, if John D had had the initiation into hermetics back uh, back in Elizabeth's time, he would have taken a a whole year and he would have spent 18 hours a day doing the exercises, and he wouldn't he wouldn't have needed to hire Edward Kelly, and and who knows what a no kid would have been if he hadn't. But still, and the same thing with Coleostro. Coleostro wouldn't have had to use children and, and, and use psychics, whatever. They could have actually done it themselves, but they would have. So Barden is tremendously important in that regard. Now, 
Gordon's next book, after initiation into hermetics, after you've you trained yourself to to visualize and to be clairaudient and to to uh, uh, to be the master of the spirits and, and the projection, then the next book is called The Practice of Magical Evocation. Well, back, oh gosh, back in the early 1970s, about 19, about 1970 it was, before I, I got The Practice of Magical Evocation, before I got initiation into hermetics, and I didn't have any, you know, I didn't know what Barden had, had come up with before that, and I got this book on evocation with all the spirit sigils, the hundreds of spirit sigils, and 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 all of this business about summoning the spirits in in the in the mirror and everything, and I read it and I I thought, God, gosh, this this guy this guy is is, oof, he's like he's from another planet. This is. Uh, uh, this was like he was mad, but it was a magnificent madness, and uh, I didn't realize, you know, that this was a culmination of everything that he had that uh, he had prepared in the first book. And so it took me a while to put the whole thing in sequence. But the practice of magical evocation is another milestone. Uh, work now that, that Martin is doing. He's doing a Galatia type uh, of magic. It's, it's evocation with a triangle and with a mirror, but it's different than Galatia in in a couple of respects. One respect is is that Martin Martin spirits, all of his his earth spirits, his planetary spirits, they all. Uh, they all try to sort of lean toward the positive. Martin, uh, in this sense, and I was discussing this earlier with, with Lauren, uh, with Sir George Andrea, who is a much better astrologer than I am, by the way, and, and we were discussing this earlier, that Martin seems to be in tune with modern astrology in the sense that he sees more good and more positive aspects in these spirits than the old uh, medieval magicians used to, and uh, so it's it's um, uh, it's it's a, it's a sort of a positive thing. Um, now, in in his spirit catalog uh, that he has in the book, uh, in magical evocation. He has spirits for the Earth sphere, and they're all, of course, they're all derived from uh, from Abermellon, from the German version of Abermellon. Uh, and Stephen Skinner took him to task for not crediting Abermellon, but then, oh, Barton didn't have to credit Abermellon. I mean, uh, he didn't he didn't have to, but that's where the all of his Earth sphere, 365 spirits of the Earth sphere, come from the German version of Abermellon. Um, and then he moving to the lunar sphere. Uh, this is where things get really interesting. We move to the lunar sphere, and these are not. He has 28 lunar spirits. They're not. They're not exactly the mansions of the moon. Although they they go by that sequence, but they're not negative. And you can see where they kind of derive from some of the mansions of the moon as you go through. The, mans the various mansions of the moon schemes that come down to us from Picatrix and various places. You can, you can see there's a relationship, but they're more positive. Everything in Barden's sequence of lunar spirits is positive. I, just for an example, uh, in all of the old mansion, all of the old mansions of the moon sequences, oh, the first, uh, the first nine of them, uh, most of them are really evil and bad. Well, actually, in Barden, you can see where they're kind of derived, but he's 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 painting a good, he's showing the good side of these spirits, and uh, this this goes along with a more modern a more modern astrological concept. Now, and he moves from the moon into Mercury, and here is very interesting. He takes the Shemai and Farash. Uh, angels, and he puts them in Hod, in Mercury, the Mercury sphere. And uh, here again, Steve Skinner wonders why he did this. Well, you know, 
I like it because uh, putting all those Shimon Barash angels in, up in Hod is really nice because we put all the Goetia spirits in Yasod and have them all falling down to the bottom of Yasod. And, of course, and each one of them, as you know, the, uh, as I've discussed before, each sphere has all the rest of the spheres of the Tree of Life in it. So, boom, all the Goetia spirits, the fallen angels, they fall down to the bottom of Yasod they're down there. Well, now if the Shemam Parash spirits are going to get it over on them, if they're going to be the, the good counterpart, then why not put them one sphere up and put them in on, which is what Barden did, so that works out fine for us. I don't mind that at all. However, you could be a nitpicker and you could say, oh, well, the Shemam Parash spirits are derived from uh, permutations of the three verses in, in Exodus and all of that. You can split hairs, but that, uh, I don't, I, I, I think Barden's okay on that one too. Now, we get up there to Venus, and he's, his Venus spirits are really, really interesting. If we have time, we'll uh, go over this Hagiel um, evocation that he has, which some people think is a physical appearance thing, and we'll, we'll go over that a little bit. Uh, but the Venus spirits are really great. But anyway, but he got up to the sun, and here is where I discovered something that I think is going to be of, of real interest to you, you to you real Barden uh, people who have been taking some licks. You, even late, lately, Barden's been taking some licks as people dig into the derivation of his spirits. Well, one of the one of the things that he's been criticized for with silver spirits is that his silver spirits are are encoded names, Arabic names of the fixed stars. Well, okay, but I discovered in in um, Michael Greer and, and Chris Warnock's wonderful new. Picatrix, which they have out with, it just came out with. It's it's the, a beautiful translation, annotated, terrifically annotated, beautiful translation of the European Latin version of the Picatrix. This is just ball. Oh, this is the this is the grand old granddaddy of all the grimoires. And and in Picatrix now, in this Picatrix, it points out that the old Sabaeans of Haran, the star worshippers who started our, our hermetic uh, uh, planetary magic tradition, that they knew that the sun was the center of the solar system, but they also thought that, that the sun was the center of the universe. And so they said that the fixed stars were the handmaidens of the sun. Now, so if if you want to, so Stephen, um, let's 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 let Martin off the hook on that one because I think I think he I, I think he had a rationale there and a very ancient rationale, uh, and you know so uh, we move on up to the to the higher planets. And uh, the Mars spirits, you know, he's, uh, he, Barton said, I'm not going to give you the Mars spirits. He said, I'm not going to give them to you because you get in trouble and uh, they're, 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 they're dangerous. And if you, if you get to that point in development, you can do them yourself. And he said that right in the book. And then somehow or other, I don't know, maybe his secretary, Adi, you know, Boyma and Adi, she, she may have put down these um um, these zodiacal, um, this list of zodiacal spirits there, that, or Deccan, excuse me, the Deccan spirits, uh, sort of as a Mars list, but it really wasn't a Mars list at all. I think that's, I, I'm not going to, you know, I can't see where that would come from, because he just said just before that, he said he wasn't going to give you any Mars spirits. And the Saturn thing the same way. So I think that the criticism of Barden and his, and his spirits, I think we pretty well put that to rest. His spirits are fine. And, you know, another thing about Barden's spirits uh, is, and uh, while we're on the subject of this, uh, as, as uh, uh, you know, a, a magician who does evocation on a regular basis, including Bardonian, uh, I can tell you this. Uh, Franz Barden did not 
he, he did not have a fully equipped magical temple. He didn't need one. He was he was a he he was such a consummate master. He did not need all the toys. He when he did his evocations, he went outside at night, went out into the park, and looked up at the stars, and with his hands in his pockets probably, and looked up at the stars and did it that way. That's the way he did it. Then he came back, had himself a cup of coffee, and and uh, and wrote in his Liber Spiritum and did the sigils in his Liber Spiritum and, and wrote about the spirits. Now that's how he did it. That isn't the way he wanted you to do it, but that's the way he did it. Now, uh, those sigils, if you look at all these sigils in um, uh, magical evocation, oh gosh, it, there's just three myriads of these these signatures, signatures of spirits, and they're they're free form, they're 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 flowing, they're 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 just like they're, they're like squiggles, they're they're like doodles, they're like squiggles, and you wonder, some people wonder how how how, how uh, why are they this way? Well, they're this way because this is the way that magicians used to get signatures of spirits. They had, and Barden doesn't really tell you this, but but he's certainly doing it. The the, the old uh, uh, magicians who were doing these evocations, they had what they called a liber spiritum, a book of spirits. And this was a book of um, of, of uh, uh, personal contact. It was it was the personal diary of a spiritual of a spirit operation. And what they would do was they would get the spirit in the mirror or in the crystal or you know how they were going to do it, and then they would ask the spirit to sign their book. And then the spirit would take over their hand. And with their pen and he and and automatic and using automatic writing, the spirit would would give you a signature or her signature, and then the uh, magician could use that signature again to summon the spirit. Well, now uh, you know this was all very well and fine and all that in the Renaissance, but unfortunately, when the Faustian school came along, you know what they did with it. Oh, this was a pact. Well, no, it wasn't a pact at all. Not originally. It it was your it was your conversation with the spirit. The spirit signs your guest book, and then you've got the spirit signature, and you can go back and use the spirit signature again. But there's something I want to point out here. Now, this is how Barrett Barden did his did his sigils. There are other ways to do sigils, of course. There are other ways the sigils are made. There, they can be um, magical symbols strung out in the line. They can be a uh, magical alphabet jammed together. They can be a monogram uh, uh, put together. They can be uh, some sort of a geometric design that relates to it. Or they can be a kamea. They can be made on a magic square. So there's any number of ways you can do magical sigils. But the way Barton did it was he did this automatic writing, which is the old Renaissance way the old Renaissance medieval way with this with the spirit book. Now, the important thing about this, and I really want to stress this, is that Barden, these these are Barden's signatures. These are his personal signatures for the spirits. Now you want to use them, and a lot of people do, if you want to use them to contact those spirits, okay, that's fine. But really, they're Barden's. You should have your own spirit book, and you should go and you should get the spirit to sign your book, your book with your hand, so there, so it's your your spirit, your signature of the spirit. That's what you should do, and that's what Barden, you know, if he was looking over my shoulder right now, I'd be smiling and he'd be saying, yeah, yeah, that's what I want you to do, <laughs> because that really is what a what a what a real magician would do. You have your, you get your own, you, you get your own signatures, and uh, so I want to make that get that point across. But, but uh, as um, as Stephen Skinner says in, in his Magician's Companion, even after criticizing the derivation of some of the spirits, it's the best. This is the best book on evocation that, that's that's come out in the in the, in the 20th century, and probably will be for quite some time to come. Now. Um, after this, 
Barden wrote a book uh, called The Key to the True Kabbalah. I mean, spelled Kabbalah. I can't even, uh, I don't have the book in front of me right now, so I, I think it's QAE. It was a Q A B B A L A H A H or something or other. Anybody, it was a, a strange spelling of Kabbalah. Uh, and uh, Barden's Kabbalah is really it's a small book of Kabbalistic formulas, and the whole book, but it's but it's a transposed. German alphabet. It's not. It, it's not the Hebrew alphabet. It's transposed. His Kabbalah is transposed into a German alphabet. So uh, it works out great if you're German, I suppose. But um, the 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 Kabbalistic system itself uh, is a set of formulas which apparently, as near as I can see and figure, and somebody I'm, I know, next week we're going to have call-ins on Barden next week, so you can get, or you Barden you Barden guys get cocked and loaded here, you can come after me on this one. But I think that Barden's main source on the formulas in his Key to the True Kabbalah are the Sefer Raziel. And this was one of the most powerful and one of the and one of the most, uh, the oldest and most powerful the Kabbalistic grimoires. And uh, I strongly, highly recommend that you get a copy of my, of my colleague and my, my esteemed colleague, Maestro Steve Sabdo, has a wonderful translation of this. And get this, compare it to, to uh, what you see in Barton's Key to the True Kabbalah. And you may, you may agree with me, or you may not. But regardless, it certainly doesn't reflect badly on Franz. Now, one thing, though, well, that we want to mention about the key to the true Kabbalah before we move on is that the really important, I think, the really important thing in the key to the true Kabbalah is his concept of the pronunciation of the holy name. Now, he claims, uh, or the publisher claims, that, that this book will show you how to truly pronounce the holy name. Well, in this case, we're talking about YHVH. Uh, I would I would prefer to use Amasha or Shama Ata, but you know what, whatever tetragrammaton you want to use, uh, I believe that Barden has come the closest to to coming up with the real truth about the about how to pronounce it, and his what he what his concept is in this book is that you visualize. Visualize in the proper color scales of all four dimensions of the Kabbalah. Visualize the Tetragrammaton as you pronounce it in all four color scales simultaneously as you do the pronunciation. And that this is the true pronunciation. So it's not so much the sound as it is the visualization and the intonation in all four dimensions, and I, that is certainly uh, certainly a very unusual but uh, but a profound uh, concept that he has there, and that alone is worth the price of the book. But let's uh, dig into this several Raziel thing and see if I'm right or if I'm wrong or whatever, and you can you can pick on me next week about that. Um, now. Uh, let's, uh, let's discuss, uh, something here about fluid condensers and volts. Um, uh, fluid condensers, this is something that people run into in, in initiation into hermetics, and you also find it later in, for charging mirrors and, and wands and whatever in allocation. But Arden has... Uh, an emphasis, and so this is an alchemical kind of a magical alchemical thing, about creating these fluid condensers, which he, which he makes up either out of metal, or out of out of plants. So it's either plant alchemy or or metal alchemy, either way you want to go. And these uh, compounds, herbal compounds or metallic compounds, 
are designed, they're called fluid condensers, not because they're condensing wet fluid. This is to condense astral fluid, condense spiritual fluid. So when you fill a wand up with, uh, with a whole bunch of different filings from, from the primary metals of the planets, well, you take, like I just did recently, we got a great big beautiful magic mirror uh, about uh, uh, 30 inches across, uh, concave mirror, and uh, I had gold filings, I had silver filings, I had lead filings, I had uh, brass filings, and and, uh, and and I and I sprinkled these all over the lacquer as it's starting to, you know, before it sets up. Sprinkled them in a, in a, in a round pattern, in a, in a pattern, and then sealed it over. Now this is the way you, you, you make a, a Bardonian magic mirror. You, you use the, and this is, this is a, is a universal metallic alchemy, universal fluid condenser for planetary magic. And the lead granules were a little bit, it was just kind of interesting. The lead granules just a little bit coarser than the rest of them, and so I can see the lead. I can see the the the, the lead granules around there, so the Saturn aspect of this thing, you know, sort of swirling around. Um, and these fluid condensers are are you can put them in uh, in magical images. You can uh, you can use them to charge uh, magical talismans. You can you can use these fluid condensers for just about everything. In uh, the film Simon King of the Witches, they call this thing an effluvial, <laughs> an effluvial condenser. <laughs> uh, effluvium being, well, you know what effluvium is, but anyway, and and they charge it, make it glow, and and the Simon King of the Witches is one of the big uh, scenes in there where they finally get the condenser charged. Uh, but actually, these condensers are, uh, they go all the way back to to the Hermetic treatises, the Asclepius, where it talks about uh, filling, filling magical statues, uh, idols full of, full of various herbs and all to attract the spirits. That's where it gets started. But it's interesting to note and, and that, uh, that Barden's recipes for fluid condensers are very similar and somewhat, somewhat simpler than the same set of, of uh, fluid condenser recipes that we find in the works of, of Pascal Beverly Randolph a hundred years earlier. So this is not something that Barden invented himself. Uh, and I don't think, I'm not going to try to say that Barden, I don't want to give the impression that Barden lifted this from P.B. Randolph and didn't give him credit. That's not, that's not it, because Randolph's, work had already been incorporated into those various lodges. And at this time, there were secret papers on Randolph's work that were floating around that, that didn't credit Randolph at all. So Barden is off the hook on that one. Uh, but Barden was an alchemist, and this, it, it, this is quite possible that, he, that this, this information uh, was, that Randolph knew it 100 years earlier, and, and Barden... Uh, uh, knew it also from the, from similar sources. It, but it, it uh, I did want to mention that because you will find, and of course when we talk about P.B. Randolph though, there's one thing, P.B. Randolph, uh, he had, uh, <laughs> he had two other things too that he came up with that, that uh, he should get credit for. One was the flashing colors that ended up in the Golden Dawn's uh, a lexicon and Randolph came up with the flashing colors for socials, and Randolph also came up with the ninth degree for the OTO. In fact, if you <laughs> read Randolph's uh, Randolph's uh, material on sex magic, it, it's just uh, it's 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 yeah, it's virtually the it's virtually the whole OTO ninth degree program laid out, and with even more detail. And Randolph, you know, I'm, I'm diverging a little bit on the bar, but Randolph, as some of you may remember, he was an American. Um, 
and he was a black man, and he was, it was back before the war between the states, he was a black man, and he was teaching white women sex magic, so that was a little shady in those days. And, and, uh, and, and finally, after the war between the states, he, um, uh, he went a little bit nuts and, and blew his brains out out in his front yard to convince his next-door neighbor that he was capable of doing it or something like that. So he got written out of all of the... Uh, of the, the rest of the textbooks on Western magic, all of his contributions got forgotten, and well, they still used them. But Randolph became the man who never was, and and yet, uh, in fact, we got a cartoon coming up in the seventh grade this time that you know, shows us uh, this little German guy with a monocle and a spiked helmet and a riding crop, and he's and he's mounted on a on a on a on a barmaid, and 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 he's going he's going and I inspire dry fear, and he's reading a and he's reading a book that's called Sex Magic by P. B. Randolph, and and the caption of the cartoon is the origins of German sex magic. So that we ought to get some laughs out of that. Anyway, Barden, by the way, so I mean, while we're talking about that, Barden was very much aware of of the the ninth degree of the OTO's ninth degree. Some people say he was a member of the OTO. That's possible. Uh, at that time, that was pre Crowley. Uh, and he does have one chapter in Initiation into Hermetics where he very, very carefully and very, um, and with great circumspection, discusses that aspect of, of, uh, uh, of magic. Um, now, uh, when it comes to elementals, Barden, Barden personified, like Schroepter and some of the other German uh, magicians, Barden was romantic, was very romantic. He personified the spirits of the elements. The gnomes were little little miners down there with their little pickaxes, and, and the sylphs were, were, were beautiful fairies flying in the air, and the, and, the, and the salamanders were the creatures of fire, and the undines were the beautiful water spirits. In fact, uh, uh, Lomer, uh, uh, Lomer, his son, was out walking with him one, one day, and, and, and Barden says, oh, do, you, do, you, do you see the gnome? And, and Lomer said, no, no, Dad, I don't see the gnome. <laughs> but, but, so Barden was, Barden was able to, to, to actually see the elementals. And this, um, this is romantic but very effective when you're working with the... Uh, with them, I, I was mentioning this this magnetic and electric fluid. This uh, has quite a um, um, application in tantra. The uh, dividing uh, the human body into areas of magnetic and electric uh, fluidity, and and the interplay of the magnetic and electric fluids. And of course, this is one of the things that Barden uh, Barden emphasized. Part of the control of not just the elements, but the flow of the power of the elements. And uh, <laughs> Simon, King of the Witches. In Simon, uh, they have the, the blue and the red robes, and they're holding, and the, the, the DA's daughter is holding a blue ball in one end, a red ball in the other, and, and uh, the, they make quite a thing about Athos and Simon, King of the Witches. And so. Uh, but the magnetic, the control of the magnetic and electric fluids is part of part of what we're talking about. Now, um, as I said, Barden was a professional hypnotist, an alchemist. He, uh, he actually made his living as a naturopath, uh, as a what we would call a home homeopathic doctor, and he had some training in that. Uh, but he still he was a natural healer, and he had his whole house was filled with alchemical tinctures, and he, had, he did a lot more with plant alchemy as far as his, his remedies are concerned than, than, than metallic alchemy. He wasn't that much into metallic alchemy as far as I can tell, uh, because most of what we can tell from his, uh, from, uh, his biography are, uh, is that he was, he was primarily using plant alchemy for, for healing purposes. Now, I want to mention, by the way, um, the book Memories of Franz Barden by Dr. Loomer Barden and Dr. M.K. And this is one of Mercure uh, Publishing's uh, efforts that just come out recently. And this is a it's, a, it's a short book, but it's a wonderful book. 
you know, it's got all kinds of pictures of Ron's and his family, and and tells the whole story of uh, of his life, and and uh, with comments on his philosophy, both by his son and by his his main student, uh, Dr. M. K. And both of whom I hope have a chance to listen to this program, uh, you know, either tonight or, or archived, because I'd certainly like to hear from you. Um, but uh, uh, one of the things that, that I, I want to point out was with, with Franz Barden, he only uh, lived to, you know, just about 50 years of age. And after what he suffered in the Nazi concentration camp, you know, that's enough to kill two or three people. But, uh, but he, um, his health wasn't good. And he was, he was overweight, and he, was, he smoked too much. In fact, he he quit smoking one time just for a whole year, just to show that just just to prove to himself he could do it. But then he went back to smoking, and he drank a lot of coffee. I can sure relate to that because I went through that period myself. Uh, and and he finally died when he died uh, after he'd been arrested by the Czech secret police for for uh, being an occultist again. That they they arrested him for for being. Uh, you know, anything to do with spirituality, as far as the communists were concerned, was was you know, enough to put you in jail. So they did, and, uh, and poor Franz was in jail, and his pancreas was give, giving out on him. And he asked his wife for, a, for a, some smoked bacon, and she sent him some, and that that did it, and that was the end of it. And and uh, but you can't blame poor Marie for that. I mean, Franz wanted it. And, he says, I, I want some bacon, and well, he got it. Well, that was it. But um, he he said, when asked, well, you know, you, you heal all these other people, and you're such a great healer, why can't you heal yourself? When he said, well, I tried one time. He said, one time I used one of my verbal remedies, and it backfired on me, and, I, and I've never done it again. He said, I... I, I had to accept, he said, I have to accept when I came into this body of mine, he said, I had to accept the karma. So what ended up happening is that his his uh, his student, who was a medical doctor, he, he prescribed regular, uh, regular medicine for him, and Barton wouldn't take any of his own remedies. He wouldn't because he believed that, that, uh, that he, uh, that, Franz Barden that he came into, he had to he had to respect that karma and let that karma play out. Now that may sound like rationalization to some people, but you know, I don't think so. I th- I, I I tend to I tend to, to to go along with that because I know I've felt as a magician. I've, I've there are times when I've thought about doing things for myself that I thought, well, I don't know whether I ought to do that, but I know you know. Uh, uh, the, I I I can I can relate to that. Anyway, um, the problem here, as I say, is that that when when he was arrested, and when he when he finally died, uh, his son tried to recover his papers, and the Czech communist police they shredded all of his notes, and and everything leading toward his book. Now, before we uh, sign off on him, there's another book of his that I want to discuss, um, and uh, sort of kind of, on the one hand, I want to I want to make a cautionary note on it, and on the other hand, I, I, I think you can really enjoy it once you understand it. Uh, Martin wrote, ah, with the help of his secretary, Ati Vodavova, and I don't know whether Ati's still alive, but uh, Ati Vodavova firmly believed that Franz was God on earth. I mean, she just absolutely worshipped him. And he wrote this this novel kind of based somewhat on his own experiences, and and but they they call it a novel, and it should be called a novel because it, it's it's uh, a bit too it's a bit too fantastic to be you know to be really. Uh, but it it it's on the other hand, there are is 
there is truth. You have to, you have to pick the truth out of Frabato. That's the, that's the name of this book. It's called Frabato, and Frabato was his magical name. And that's a contraction of Franz and Barden and and the town he was from and Germany and whatever. And he put together uh, like you like you'd put together a, a magical sigil. You know, he put together this name for himself, Frabato, and that's what he used as a stage name. And so the, 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 the novel is called Ferbato. It also has some, some um, spiritual uh, writings of his in the back, which are also very, very good. Uh, but Ferbato is um, yeah, it's fantastic, and it's kind of like, uh, it's sort of like, um, like Doctor Strange. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a very romantic and a very... A very fantastic story, but it but it captures uh, the flavor of the time, and it, and there is, as I say, if you read between the lines, you can you can uh, some read uh, read some truth in it. Um, you know, when uh, I was I said at the beginning of this um, of this program that uh, we would discuss um, some of the some of the um, well, the derivations and all that we've made from Barden's work, I, I want to explain that um, those of you who are familiar with, with the OTA, you know that, that um, we use magic mirrors uh, with a regular uh, optical mirror and a dark optical mirror. And we key off of the reflection of our faces, and we use that 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 reflective morph. That, that when you stare at your at your reflection in a dim light with the candles, and uh, your face will black out, and then when it returns, it has a it, it's distorted into some other form. And of course, when you put the sigil on the mirror, and, the, and that that helps to direct the, the change of the form to where it becomes the spirit. And when you're when you're properly trained, of course, you can talk to the spirit. The spirit can talk to you, and that's the method we use for Croatia. So that is not that is not Franz Barden's magical mirror method. I want to make that clear. Franz Barden, his mirrors were not optical. They were not reflective. They were made out of plaster, and they were concave. Uh, and you know, hopefully round if he could do them that way, and they, and and he would uh, make them out of plaster, make them you know fairly smooth but, but concave, and then he'd put this he'd put this these fluid condensers right directly on the face of the mirror, and then cover them with black lacquer, seal them up, and then you would use that and you would stare at that, and that would be your your focus. Uh, and that would be your your conjuration device. And you put them on a triangle, very similar to the way we do it, with an elevated triangle and the whole business. But uh, but the mirrors themselves, um, I, I'm looking at one. Uh, Sandra has one up on the on on right now. And I'm looking I'm looking at our our great big black mirror with a toddler stuck in the middle of it. Uh, but uh, the uh, the, these were definitely non-optic. Now, my feeling is this. I think that when you get above your sod and you get past you know, the Galatia, above your sod, I believe that, that you should use non-optic mirrors. So I'm all, for, I'm all for Barden's method. I think you should go non-optic uh, when you get above your sod when, when it comes to the mirrors. And therefore... I'm a firm believer in, in Barden's program and his uh, training. I think that using the optic mirror with it with Galatia down in the bottom of your saw is a you know that's a good way to start. Shows you you can do it. And and uh, and but when you get higher on up, I think you should definitely be working uh, working with your trained imagination. Remember that your trained highly trained imagination using using these wonderful uh, methods and training program of his. Now, we've developed um, 
over a period of time, we've developed uh, ways of enhancing or making Barden's exercises go a little smoother and, and a little easier. Um, you know, techniques like, uh, oh, for instance, uh, uh, Barden had, uh, had you doing Kim's game where you put out a bunch of common objects on a tray and you, you memorize them and then you try to recreate that that picture of them so you can so you can remember them and uh, that Bill Gray came up with an improvement on that he said okay use a shot glass and a, and a, and a disc and a red paintbrush and a paring knife and then you got the grail hallows and you can work with those and visualize those that's an improvement but basically Barton is his his methods are are you know really really good and they should be they should be used in, in this program. Uh, I think that uh, Barton is probably one of, if not the most uh, uh, most prominent and and most uh, highly skilled and innovative magician of the 20th century. I would, and I know there are people who would say, well, what about Crowley? Well, no, Crowley made his contributions. Crowley certainly did make his contributions. But, but Barden, uh, and Barden's idea of hooking yoga up with magic and putting the two together and making it go and training, training people uh, to, to be genuine magicians, this is a marvelous accomplishment. I highly recommend Barden's books and, and uh, starting with initiation into hermetics and then moving on to magical evocation and key to the true Kabbalah. And then if you want to read for Bato, well, for fun and whatever else you want to get out of it, that's good too. And, uh, and then, but definitely, definitely, as you do this, get memories of Franz Barden uh, by uh, Dr. Loomer and, and Dr. M.K. Uh, from Mercur. Definitely get that one and read it. That's wonderful. Okay, that's all for tonight. Next week, call in. We're going to have call-ins on Franz Barden. And I know that some of you guys are going to want to call in. You gals are going to want to call in. So call in, and, and if I made some mistakes, have at me. <laughs> that's what I'm here for. Okay, we'll see you next week. And meanwhile, good magic.